Uh, my name is Alan Barnard. I'm CEO of Goldwood Research Labs. And we have a couple of learning objectives for today. Um, I'm going to start off with presenting the four concepts of flow that Dr. Goldwood developed. He wrote a beautiful article about it called Standing on the Shoulders of Giants. I'll give you a, a, just a brief overview of, of what the essence of the article is. Uh, one of the key things that Dr. Goldwood tried to show there is that there's a difference between a concept and an application. A concept is universal and an application is specific. An application always have boundary conditions. So critical chain project management is an application. Toyota production system is an application. Um, they might apply to many environments, but they do have boundary conditions outside of which they might not work. Uh, they might even harm the system if you try to force them onto an environment where they're not appropriate for. So I'll just clarify a little bit about what we mean by the concepts of flow. And there's kind of an inconsistency between the concepts of flow and the five focusing steps. Uh, the five focusing steps start off with step one as identify the constraint. When you look at these uh, concepts of flow, it doesn't talk about the constraint or bottleneck. So what should be the process that we should follow when we start an implementation? The concepts of flow are referring to specific mistakes that are being made. The, the ones that is mentioned in the concepts of flow is that the only mistakes. What are the other ones? And then we'll end off the session with uh, showing you how we can use dynamic simulation modeling to understand a little bit better the dynamics within complex systems. Because simply how it works is you define all the parts you define the rules by which these parts interact. You define the variations, the randomness within these parts. You press the play button and you see what happens. So um, Andre will be showing you the, the simulation that we have been working on. So let's start with uh, part one, which is standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, when we look at the desirable effects, there's commonality between the desirable effects that we want within any environment, regardless of what that type of environment is, whether it's production or projects or back office or maintenance uh, or service type of an organization, if there's already a backlog there, which means we're not meeting demand, we want to be able to get rid of the backlog. Um, we want to be able to increase flow rate of throughput. We want to reduce flow time, especially if there's time sensitivity around flow time, uh, or maybe even give us the ability to capitalize it by charging premiums on it. We want to be able to reduce uh, costs and improve quality and reduce the stress of managing such a system. So the desirable effects are, are, are all common. Uh, there's nothing unique about the desirable effects that we want. What theory of constraints have provided, and some of you might remember the original current reality tree that Goldert presented around the steel industry, is that when we see the opposite of these desirable effects, when we see long and growing backlogs, when we see low throughput, low compared to the capacity of a bottleneck, right? when we see very long lead times, what do we mean by long lead times? It's much, much longer than the physical touch time. Right? It's taking us four weeks to get product out the door, and yet the touch time is just a few hours. If we see poor quality, if we see high costs and in inventory and investment and lots of stress, what's the underlying cause of that? The common wisdom is that the underlying cause is complexity, uncertainty. And that as long as that's the case, our focus should be to simplify things, reduce our product ranges, reduce the variations. What Goldratt showed was, yes, complexity, uncertainty, variation do have an impact on these, but the primary cause for them is that simply we're using the wrong rules to manage our systems. We're essentially using rules that are focused on local or short-term optimization whereas the rules should be focused on global, long-term optimization. So saying that, we know that no system can survive very long when the demand exceeds the supply, but also vice versa. If the supply substantially exceeds the demand, the system will, won't survive. There will be overwhelming pressure to realign, to balance the demand with supply. 
So the question is, how do I balance demand with supply? And a practical way of looking at it is kind of a cumulative flow diagram um, where the red line is showing the arrival of work into the system. Say in this case, the work arrives into our system, our environment, whatever it is, at a rate of about 20 per day. And currently, the departures, the green line, uh, the completion rate is about 10 per day. Now, you can imagine over time when those two graphs are diverging, what will happen over time is that vertically is my work in process or backlog, and that will grow exponentially over time. Horizontally is my lead time, the time it takes me to, to process work that arrives until I can complete it. So horizontally is my lead time. So over time, lead times and work in process will grow exponentially. So how can I stop that from happening? Well, I can reduce the demand. I can have some practical mechanism that will allow me to figure out that actually I can only do 10 a day. Committing to do 20 a day is not practical. It's not possible. It's actually lying to our customers. So that's one way I can reduce the demand. The other way, of course, is I can increase the supply. How do I increase the supply? Most of the time, when the demand exceeds the supply, people say, I need more resources. I need to double up, right? In this case, you know, double the resources so I can get close to the 20, build another factory. Um, there's a combination approach which is both reduce the demand and increase the supply. Um, so those are just practically three ways that I can try and close the demand gap. And the question is, what, where's the, the best leverage? Should I try to do one, the other, or a combination of them? Dr. Goldred wrote this article called Standing on the Shoulders of Giants. And what he tried to do was he, he studied the inventions or innovation by Henry Ford and Taichi Ono and try to understand what was the generic concepts behind the applications. And what he found was that, in summary, the first thing that both of them realized, both Henry Ford and Taichi Ono, was that of all the things that you could be focusing on improving, because remember, we can focus on improving uh, redu reduction of backlog, we can focus on improving the throughput, we can focus on improving the quality, the costs, etc. is that the prime objective of operations should be improving flow, and specifically reducing lead time or flow time in the system. And the reason for that is very simple. If I take a project's environment, for example, I have three objectives. I want to reduce the time of the project, reduce the delays, I want to increase the number of projects that I do, I want to improve the quality and the scope. When, and of course, reduce the, the costs associated, especially costs associated with overruns. If I can find a way of, of getting the project done faster in less time, it has a positive impact on all the other objectives. When I do projects faster, I can get more projects done. When I do projects faster, typically my costs will go down. And also, I have to make less sacrifices or maybe even no sacrifices on the scope. So out of the three objectives, Goldratt basically said, he realized that Ford and Ono selected the one objective that by achieving that will help you with all the other objectives. So they realized that the, the overall objective operations is to continuously fight to improving flow, specifically to reduce the flow time. And when you read up on it, you find Henry Ford in this article they mentioned um, in 1926, total lead time from an iron, uh, the ton of iron ore coming out of the mine until that ton of iron ore has been converted into a Model T and it's driving into the dealership, total lead time is around 81 hours. And this was in 1926. We've worked with some companies today that own that whole supply chain from the iron ore mines and up to the, the car dealerships. And if you simply add up all the inventories that are built up in each of these parts, 
you very quickly get to six, nine months of lead time. And that means that the poor guy at the beginning of the supply chain has to be forecasting nine months ahead of time of what are the type of products or grades of raw materials that they need to be producing. Uh, when you have that as 81 hours, there's no forecasting required. When things go wrong in the wrong way, um, there's a massive downturn. You're only stuck with about 80 hours or so of work in process, so it's a much lower risk. Oh, no, said the same thing. He said, all that we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the time from receiving a customer order until we are able to supply it. So that becomes the primary objective. But it's no use to tell people that the primary objective is to improve flow, um, or even when you say to reduce flow time, when the causes of flow delays uh, or capacity losses are counterintuitive. So if you just tell people an objective and you don't point out what are the common mistakes that are being made that's causing delays in flow, they will, of course, follow their intuition and might be doing the wrong thing that end up <coughs> making it even worse. So somebody might decide that to improve flow, I should increase my batch size. Somebody might decide that to improve flow of work, I'm in a project environment, I should start multitasking. These are all things that most people is very intuitive to them. It feels like it's helping. In fact, it's doing the opposite. So what the second concept is, is that if you want people to improve flow, think of the simplest possible practical mechanism that you can give them to ensure they don't make the mistake that most contributes to flow being lost, to either flow time delays or to flow rate losses losses in the capacity of my bottleneck. And what Goldratt realized was that both Henry Ford and Ono realized that the major thing that's causing flow delays was overproduction. People were producing things that they supposed not to be producing. So what's the simplest possible mechanism to stop that from happening is Henry Ford use space as a mechanism. It said there's a space between my process and the next process. When that space is full, stop producing. Very simple. Don't need a computer system for it. I just paint on the, on the ground a space. Once the space is full, stop producing. And this suddenly stops people from producing stuff that's not required, that will not help the flow, but in fact deteriorate the flow. Ono came along and said, fantastic mechanism, but what if you produce more than one thing? It's great if you, uh, you can get any car as long as it's black, so everybody's really just focusing on producing one part, but what if you have multiple finished products, which Toyota at that time already had? And I went and st studied the, the Ford plant, and when I asked Henry Ford this question, what do you do if you have variety, he said, I haven't had that problem yet, good luck. They were very disappointed. They, uh, apparently the story goes that they walked into a supermarket, the Piggly Wiggly supermarket. It was the first self-service supermarket where you didn't go to the counter and ask for one pound of, of flour, but you could select it from the shelves. And I realized but the shelves are kind of like space, um, how do I decide how much of a specific product to keep <coughs> on the shelf? Because if I have a space between two work centers and I'm not just producing one part, but two parts, I don't only need information how many parts I produce before I should stop, where adding more parts won't help, but I need to know what part to produce. And I realized here the supermarket had already figured it out. How much stock do I keep on a shelf? It's very simple. How long does it take me to replenish this item from my supplier? And how much do I expect to sell during that time? I get a weekly delivery. I expect to sell about 10 a week. I need 10. And that's where the idea of Kanbans came from, is that Kanbans became a very practical mechanism of preventing people from overproducing or at the same time prevent them from underproducing the parts that's actually required. How did it work? Suddenly the space was divided into smaller spaces 
with different Kanbans, and the size of the Kanban was simply calculated on how frequently do I make this part and how much is expected to be consumed within that frequency. So it provided a very practical mechanism. Goldratt came along and said, but what if you produce such a variety of parts that by creating Kanbans for all of them, you might be causing the, the same problem that you're trying to solve. Because say I have a product, it needs a part, I'm not sure when this product will be sold in the future, but I have a Kanban sitting there, and I'm now wasting capacity producing, filling up this Kanban, and I'm not sure when it will ever be used. In the meantime, there's a Kanban that's gone empty of requiring parts that actually is something that I've already shipped now. So he said, as soon as the variety becomes too large, I can't use stock anymore as a practical mechanism to produce overproduction. And he said, the only practical way I have to control the amount of work and process on the floor will be time. And I'll share with you just a slide after this to show you just practically what it means. He said that the other thing that struck him when he analyzed Ford and, and Ono was the idea that they really abolished local efficiencies. Anything that was causing people to take actions that were either reducing the flow rate or increasing the flow time had to be abolished. Policies like batching, so it's not just overproduction, but it's other policies. Uh, what are these policies? Um, Sometimes you don't know until you start, so you start off, you measure very carefully flow time and flow rate, and you see what else is causing delays and losses in capacity, and you simply abolish the measurements that are causing people to take those actions. And then the last one is we are responsible for continuously balancing demand with supply, so what's the focusing process? that when demand starts increasing or the, the supply starts deteriorating, how do I know where a process improvement is really required? How do I know where an investment and in capacity will make the biggest impact? Or where I can actually reduce costs without it jeopardizing the performance? So Goldratt said the last thing that they had was this focusing mechanism. Of course, with Henry Ford, it was very simple. You can see where things were being delayed very quickly. They had actual traffic cops following batches of work traveling through the system, and they had two jobs. When things were getting stuck, they had to get it unstuck, but they also had to write the procedure to make sure it never happens, because the idea is to keep on improving the flow. Whereas with the Toyota production system, they had a simple mechanism where they systematically reduced the Kanbans. The size of the Kanbans it will cause problems to show out almost like a, an iceberg starting to stick out, dropping the water levels, and that's where people would be focusing on. In TOC, the focusing mechanism is to simply track what's causing buffers to become red and black and trying to understand what are the main causes of those and focusing the improvement on those. So let's just quickly look at the practical mechanism. So yeah, I have five processes. I have a, a practical mechanism of space in between them. Um, when the space is full, it gives the instruction to A to stop. What, it can do anything else, but there's no more value in filling up more of the space. The space is full, so stop. And the priority system is, is very simple, is when there's, there's too little <coughs> expedite, if there's too much, start slowing down. As I'm increasing variety, I have to replace that mechanism of space with stocks within the space. How much of the space should be occupied by a certain element? Um, and again, I can use the same priority system where if a Kanban goes empty, it gets higher priority. If a Kanban is full, it's green, and it gets the lower priority. But as I mentioned, when the variety of parts increase to such an extent that it no longer becomes practical to keep on filling in Kanbans when you don't know whether those parts will be required in the short term or might ever be required. The only other practical mechanism is to use time. MRP, when it was originally designed, was in fact using time as a mechanism to release work in process into the system. 
the mistake it made was it released work in process for each part of that system, so it had multiple small time buffers. Why is this bad? Because when I tell A, you have a start time and an end time, and I tell B, you have a start time and an end time, if A finishes early and B isn't ready, that work in process will be moved into a store, which means that any early finish will not be reported or be benefited from. Whereas if it's late, of course, B can't start on the, on the scheduled start time of the job, so all the delays are passed on. And this is one of the reasons why MRP fundamentally, if you are scheduling at a very detailed level with start and end times using time buffers, will never be able to be reliable because of this very simple concept where the delays are passed on but early finishes are not passed on. So how do I stop that problem is I aggregate the buffers. I put the buffers together. And this was the original development of DBR. It had two simple time buffers. Uh, a shipping buffer that was protecting the customer and a constraint buffer that was con protecting the constraint from being starved. SDBR took it one step further and said, why don't we combine those two time buffers all into one? And now I don't have this problem anymore. So let's translate this, which is one of the second objectives of the article that Dr. Goldred wrote, was we have these concepts that if we want to improve any environment, number one priority should be improving the flow, specifically reducing the flow time, which means pay attention to all the things that's causing delays in the flow. Number two, provide them with a practical mechanism. If you're doing a single product, using space as a mechanism to prevent overproduction is the most practical. If you start increasing variety, you can go to Kanbans. If the variety becomes too big, you're in a, a make-to-order environment with many SKUs, the only other practical mechanism to control the release of work in process so I don't have too much or too little becomes time. So let's look... I have two flow environments. The one I call production, the other one I call projects. What is the difference between these two? Can you see any obvious difference between those two, apart from the fact that one is called uh, production and the other one projects? Not really, right? It's exactly the same routing or, or, or dependency between the various tasks. So what's the process that we should follow? The first one and this is now translating a concept of using time as a, as a mechanism of controlling the release of work into the system, so I don't have too much or too little, is to separate the work time and the buffer time. So in a production environment, what we know is the touch time or the cycle time is a small fraction of the total lead time of the system. So when I try to separate that, what I'll find is that for process one, the little remaining blue part might be an hour. The, the total time it normally takes to, for work to go through process one might be a week. So the small remaining part of the blue is the actual work time. The rest is actually a time buffer. So that's the first step I can, I can follow. If I go to a project's environment, the only difference is that in a project's environment, the work time is about 50% of the total time that I use typically for planning the release of work into the system. But the first step is generic, is separate work and buffer time. The second step is aggregate the time buffers along a direction of flow. So rather than I have two there, I combine them into one behind the bottleneck, which in this case is defined as being read a capacity constraint, I have one, and then on this feeding path, I also have one. And I do the same on my project flow diagram. The next one is to remove unnecessary time buffers um, and to cut those time buffers by 50% because I'm getting the benefit of aggregation. I'm no longer protecting the parts of the system. I'm starting to protect the total system. So along the paths, I am combining time buffers and I'm cutting 50% of the time buffer to give me a benefit 
in terms of completion rate. Because remember, if I simply release the work with the same time buffer as before, I can't increase throughput, right? If I am able to reduce the, the time that it takes me to do work by 50%, I can double the throughput rate. So in the production environment, because my time buffer is essentially almost 100% of my total time previously, my planned release time, by separating the work versus buffer time and cutting my buffer time by 50%, I'm almost saving 50% of the total. So the benefit I'm getting is a 50% reduction in lead time, whereas in the project's environment, I'm only getting about a 25% reduction in lead time. And then the last one is a simplified even more by combining all the time buffers according on one direction into one. So I have one project buffer, one feeding buffer, um, and in the case of the production flow, I have one time buffer that represents the overall system. So that's a kind of a way of taking a generic concept and turning it into an application. Figuring out what's the specific boundary conditions of the application, the difference between production and projects is the ratio that the cycle time or work time makes up of the total lead time that's typically in the system. And suddenly I have a new mechanism that says, okay, how do I know how much ahead of time I should release work so I don't have it released too early or too late or too little or too much? Let's take the current system. If it's production environment, essentially I can cut it by half. If our current lead times is four weeks, I can create a time buffer of two weeks. So I can cut it by 50%. If it's a project type of environment, I can cut it by about 25%. So if we are currently planning projects to take 12 months, planning it to be released nine months ahead of time will provide me with this perfect match. And we'll show the U-shape a little bit later. You've seen it from yesterday. Not too early, not too late, not too little, not too much. So this is just a simple translation of moving from a concept into a specific application. In the same way that Ono moved from the concept of focusing on flow time and reducing flow time and providing people with a practical mechanism of stopping over production from space to stock, Goldrat took it from stock to time. But the general concept is I need some practical mechanism to stop people from overproducing. So the general rule is cut the existing time buffer for releasing work by about 50%. Now, there's another part that a time buffer plays, which is the prioritization. It provides us with a prioritization mechanism. So if it's red, it's more important than yellow or, or green. In a project uh, type of environment, it's a little bit different to production. So think about, I'm starting the, this works order. Say my time buffer is three weeks to keep it simple. After a week, it will go from green to yellow and then into red. As long as my touch time is still smaller than my red zone, even if it's in the red and I haven't even started it, I can still get it out on time. So using a simple elapsed time as a prioritization mechanism is sufficient. The problem in the project's environment is because my work time is a substantial portion of my time buffer, if I was using that, I will get the warning too late. And by the time that a project goes into red, I would simply not have enough time to still complete it on time. So I need another mechanism. And again, it's this, uh, this session is not about explaining all these concepts, but just translating it is to say, I need a mechanism, and we have a very simple fever chart that says on the right-hand side there, another way of setting the priority is, looking at two different projects and saying which of these two projects are consuming their time buffer faster than the other one. And I can measure that already from day one. My time buffer is 50% of my total lead time. If after a day I've consumed more than 50% of that, it's raising it into a red. It's immediately giving me a warning. So let's uh, look at clarifying and expanding these concepts of flow a little bit. Yes, but what do we mean by improving flow versus balancing flow, and how does this relate to Little's law? 
Why is a constraint or bottleneck not mentioned in the four concepts of flow? Have you thought about that? So we presented these four concepts. This is the universal way now of looking at improving any environment. Make sure that improving flow, specifically reducing flow time, is a number one priority and that we are measuring it. <coughs> Secondly, give people practical mechanisms to prevent overproduction. Abolish any form of local optimization. Have a, a balancing mechanism, a focusing mechanism. Where is the bottleneck? What should be step one when we start an implementation? What should be step one? Should it be identify the constraint or the bottleneck? Or should it be put in a mechanism to stop overproduction? If you look at our strategy and tactic trees, step number one is always control the release of work into the system. Doesn't mention bottleneck. Doesn't say identify the bottleneck. Why not? Any suggestion? Yes, Ross. Very good. That's, that's one answer is that when I'm starting, and especially if I have a system that have balanced capacities, there's just too much noise. Any one I pick is probably going to be wrong. What my hypothesis is, is a very simple hypothesis, is that a, a, a bottleneck or constraint is only important if it's the primary cause of delays in flow. Can I repeat that? So bottleneck or constraint is only important if it's the primary cause of delays in flow. Many times it's not. Many times there's other things like batching, unsynchronized priorities, allocating resources or buffers in the wrong place. Right, so we need a, a way of seeing when is the bottleneck the primary cause of delays in flow and when is it not. Because when it is, and I focus on it, I make sure it's never starved or blocked, and I, I reduce setup times, then I in, reduce cycle times, it will immediately improve flow. But what if it's not? Is overproduction the only decision mistake that we make uh, when we are planning work, executing work, measuring, and improving? And, and if not, what are the other mistakes? So... Let's look at going back to our cumulative flow diagram. Um, I discovered this kind of by invention. Um, I was doing a project at Cisco Systems around 2001 and 2002. And in the project, uh, we were asked to, to look at some of the most fundamental problems that they were facing. And one of them that was shared by John Chambers, the CEO at the time, was asking, I go to customers, one of their biggest complaints is always, if we have a disruption in the supply chain, why does it take us so long to recover? So yes, we had a weak problem with one of our suppliers that, that couldn't supply. Why does it take us weeks and months to recover? And I tried to explain it. I thought I was pretty good at communicating. Turns out, uh, not so much, because the explanation didn't make sense. I apologized for wasting time and said, I will come back and I will try and see if I can come up with a graphical way of explaining why a change in supply or in demand can result in a very long delay in recovery of lead times and, and throughput rates. We, of course, knew Little's Law is something that governs the, the system, and you can read it off very nicely from a cumulative flow diagram. So over time, I've got orders arriving. Uh, this first order that's arriving, let's see if we can use this guy. Oh, okay, doesn't look like it's working. So assuming that we've got uh, the, the first order arriving at shipping sometime later. So horizontally, as I mentioned, is my supply lead time. So this is the lead time or flow time in my equation. And vertically is my work in process, the amount of work in process that's stuck in it. So I knew I could calculate it, but Little's law is true on average. So let's see what will happen if there's an increase in demand over a peak period, and then it slows down again to the normal rate of arrival. Can you see that work in process and lead time will permanently increase unless I have the capacity, the catch-up capacity? Does it make sense? 
And that's why, why after a peak period it takes us a long time to recover. The only reason why it's not always visible is during a peak people buy not just enough for the peak, but because of the good prices they also buy for a few months. So just straight after the peak the demand actually dramatically reduces. But if it doesn't, it, this system will never recover. Lead times and, and working process or working capital will permanently increase. The same is true if, if I've had a short-term dis disruption in my supply side. So for some week, I didn't produce anything. My supply was flatlined, and then I start producing again. The same thing will happen. Over time, my lead times and work in process will permanently increase. And going back to some of the graphs that I showed yesterday about what makes a system fragile is over time, if the gains I get when things go well is less than the pain I suffer when things go badly, over time, lead times will keep on extending. Working capital will keep on extending until it becomes too much and I have to make some kind of intervention. So the cumulative flow diagram, it's a very nice way of checking if the flows are balanced. And we actually introduced this as a primary measurement within the ERP system. What makes it nice is I can do this at a company level. So if my vertical axis is dollars of products shipped, uh, I can both capture orders arriving in terms of dollars, and I can get dollars of shipments going out, and very quickly I can see if my demand and supply is balanced. Or it's very useful if you think about a stock buffer. If my stock buffer goes into red, I don't know why it's gone into the red. It could be that I've sold or consumed faster than what I expected, but it could also mean that my supply lead time was longer than expected. Having this cumulative flow diagram is a very quick, quick way of checking which of those two primary causes explained why suddenly my buffers are going into the red. So it's very useful. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned, is when they're starting to, to diverge from each other, what we know is that um, my queues will start growing exponentially. So as, they are, as my utilization of a resource is approaching 80%, uh, I've got a capacity constraint and my queues will start growing exponentially. At the same time, my reliability will drop. Uh, we had in South Africa uh, a couple of years back, we were dealing with a, a supplier to, to the automotive industry that for five years were maintaining uh, seven days delivery lead time. Perfect record, 100% on time in full. And uh, a new sales manager was appointed, and they were being asked to find ways of increasing sales. They looked at the capacity utilization, found it was only about 70%, and got an export order. And almost overnight, their lead times went from seven days to about 40 days. And you can see why. It doesn't take a big increase in demand to just suddenly get lead times to grow exponentially, because essentially you're getting these two graphs to start diverging, right? That's the bad news. The good news is that we don't need a substantial reduction in demand or an increase in supply to get it back to stability. And this is something that's generic, and when we, when we play with the simulation, we can actually see it happening. You can take a system that's in chaos. What do we mean by chaos? It means it's unpredictable. You don't know how much is going to come out, when it's going to come out. Lead times and throughput rates are highly variable, which is the nature of a chaotic system. You can take that chaotic system and very quickly make it stable just by moving it from the right to the left in terms of the utilization of capacity constraint resource. And that's essentially what happens if we start controlling the release of work in process in the system. We're actually causing, for some time, not to release orders, we're causing the demand rate to start dropping, and once it's stable, then we can start increasing it again. So that's why the TOC solution work, both conceptually and in a specific application, as we take actions that simply take us out of chaos and bring us into positive. These things are very counterintuitive, they're non-linear. So when I try to explain it, I normally try to use an example that we all have some kind of intuition about, which is uh, traffic, right? So think about I have 
60 kilometers to travel to work, and I can travel at 120 kilometers per hour. Or for the American guys, you have to travel 30 miles at 60 miles an hour. So how long will it take me to get to my destination? As a, as a driver, I'm interested in the flow time. How long does it get me to get from point A to point B? So of course, it'll take me about half an hour. How do you think that flow time will vary as the number of cars on the road increases? So if I'm the only car on the load it, and I can maintain my speed of, of 60 miles an hour, 120 kilometers per hour, I can get there in half an hour. But what if there was two cars? Do you think it will change it? No, probably not. Up to what point will it start changing it? Well, it's up to the point where me slowing down and catching up again, those two things don't cancel out anymore. So when I'm slowed down and because of the speed limit, I can't catch up all the time that I've lost because I've slowed down, it'll start increasing the time it takes me to get to the destination. So I'm not sure what this number is. You can build a very simple simulation model and pick up what it is. Is it 100 cars, 200 cars, 300 cars before you start actually seeing your flow time or lead time starts increasing? And initially it increases linearly and then up to a certain point, which is, uh, we call bumper to bumper traffic, suddenly the same distance, rather than taking me half an hour, can take me five hours. Right? When it's really maximum congestion. What happens to my flow rate? So now I'm looking not at the driver, but I'm looking at the person that owns the road. He's interested in, is this road, does it have enough capacity to cope with the demand during peak times? Right? As the number of cars on the road is increasing, of course the throughput rate, the number of cars leaving point B at the end will, will increase. Up to a point. What is that point? It's my bottleneck capacity, right? There's some kind of tunnel that everybody has to go through. It can't increase beyond that. So the bottleneck is not just important in terms of is it causing the major reason for the delays? It also provides a theoretical maximum of what my throughput rate or my flow rate can be. What will happen if I keep on increasing the cars? Well, one speculation is it doesn't matter, right? Because I can't get more out, but there is this thing called congestion which now, if the traffic isn't moving, you know, the flow rate passing a certain point starts actually dropping dramatically. So it's a, it's a kind of an intuitive example, I think, that just explains that these things are not that easy to predict of when does it move from one zone to the other zone, but there are definitely three distinct zones in the same way that we get three distinct zones when we're looking at the amount of things that we do as managers... Right? If I have too little, if I have too much. If there's too little work in process, there will be lots of management attention required because all my resources are idle and I'm under huge pressure to increase utilization of these resources. If there's too much work in process, I will get massive congestion. Lead times will start increasing, flow rates will start dropping, maximum attention. So, Another point of clarity I realized when it says improving flow and specifically reducing flow time is what do we mean by flow time? So here's the total flow time, and these are the key points. The first point is when the demand for the work that I'm doing in my system, and the demand could be I make widgets, I do project tasks, I process people, I process information. The demand is known, how long does it take me to know that there's a demand for my service? This is what we call the demand flow time. A product is consumed at a retailer. How long before they place an order on a supplier? That's my demand lead time. The supply lead time is how long it takes us to complete the work. 
So when we're talking about flow time and specifically reducing flow time, I'm talking about reducing the overall flow time, not just the supply lead time. Now, again, if I go into an environment, do you think it's important to know where's the biggest delay? Is it because it takes them a long time to know that there's a demand for the work that that environment needs to be doing, that agency needs to be doing, that factory needs to be doing, or there's no delay, but the, the biggest problem is in supply lead time? I think it is, right? But because we haven't defined properly what we mean by flow time, that is actually this total time, people won't pay attention to it. Of course, in the supply lead time itself, there's components to it. There's backlog, there's work, which is inside of the machines, and there's queues waiting for resource to become available. And again, knowledge of, of what that distribution looks like is really important. If I look at a, 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 an analysis of the flow time and I realize most of the work is stuck in backlog compared to in process or in, 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 uh, in queue, that changes fundamentally what my focus for improvement is going to be. So I can call, for lack of a better word, all the work together, work in backlog, work in process, work in queue, I can call work in system. Let's look at an application of this in a stock environment. I have a maximum stock level. I wait until the stock drops before I place an order. The top part is my demand flow time. The bottom part is my supply flow time. Where's our main focus when we go into this type of environment? Demand flow time. We simply say just place orders more frequently. You're wasting the majority of that flow time by not placing orders, right? In a similar environment in the health system, what is demand flow time in the health system? The time until you go to the doctor. You know there's a problem, but you procrastinate, you procrastinate, and then finally you go to the doctor. And the doctor goes, you know what, it will take me just a few minutes to treat you, but now you're in a crisis, right? If you had come earlier, I, we could have done a much better job. So I realized that, yes, these four concepts are very universal, but we shouldn't just read over them and think we understand them. We should define exactly what we mean by flow time. It's made up of demand and supply flow time, and where we are losing most of the time becomes the primary focus for our intervention. So here's my system. Imagine this is the results I get. It takes me 100 days or 100 units of work in the system. 80 of them is, is stuck in backlog. 10 in work in process, 10 in work in queue. What's the problem? What's the solution? Are they controlling the release of work into the system? Yes, they are, because most of the stuff is in backlog. If they weren't controlling the release of work in the system, there would be very little backlog. It will look like number two. Right? So if you take environment number one and you go to them and you say you should control the release of work and process into the system, what benefit will they get? None. These guys potentially have a real bottleneck or they are processing work that they shouldn't be working on. Right? We should be reducing the, the demand. We had a case in one of the government institutions where the work outside of the system, these are people that actually qualify for grants, and this is not the real numbers, but it's an order of magnitude, was about 1,000, right? It was the real numbers were about a million people in the state qualify for grants. I asked them to tell me how many people are, are waiting for a grant to be processed or are already receiving the grant. And it was this kind of order of magnitude. It was a tenth of the people that qualify for the grant. How can that be? Until you speak to them, they've given up. There's simply not enough budget, not enough beds for kids with special needs. So people don't even apply. Right. So just knowing where the stuff is sitting, where all the time or the work and process is sitting, becomes a really important part of where we should focus improvement. And that, to me, personally, was my big insight 
where when I follow the five focusing steps, I'm not paying attention to any of this. All I'm doing is I'm looking at where's the bottleneck, what percentage of time am I losing because of starvation, blockage, rework, etc., overproduction, and that's where my focus is. Whereas this is focusing me on the flow of the whole system and asking me to pay attention where is most of the work waiting or getting delayed or getting stuck because that should point us to where the biggest leverage is. So just a final uh, note on this um, before I want to give you a quick mystery is that when I'm plotting workflow time versus workflow rate, in most environments what we see is this, is that the lead times are much, much longer than the touch time or the work time. And that the actual throughput of the system is much lower than the capacity of the bottleneck. Do you agree? Basically what we want is we want something to look like that where the theoretical maximum throughput of the system is, is determined by the bottleneck and the theoretical minimum of the flow time is determined by the touch time. Plus, of course, some buffer time to compensate for variation. Does it make sense? So just a very simple graph and uh, ask the question, how do I move from the one to the other? And this portion here is the critical amount of whip that I need that's not too much and not too little. And I can calculate that in environments that's relatively simple, in environments that's quite complicated, which is most environments. It's not easy to know how much is too little and too much. In a simulation model, I can play. I can change the rate at which I'm releasing to see what happens to my flow time and flow rate. So let me give you a, a last mystery before we start going into the, the simulation modeling side. As I mentioned, on all of our strategy and tactic trees, whether you're in production or in projects or in a distribution environment, it says, start by controlling the release of work. What does Little's law predict? What will happen if I reduce the whip? What will happen to my flow rate? Yes? It will go down. Can you, can you understand now why people is, are so nervous when we tell them to reduce the whip. Because even if they, they don't know Little's Law, intuitively they go, what do you mean? Flow rate will come down, throughput will come down. Does it make sense? And yet we do that. And we just kind of assume that they should accept us, that somehow this is a good thing. When will flow rate not be affected by a reduction in whip? when lead time comes down in the same proportion. So if I cut whip by 50% and lead time as a result comes down by 50%, at least my throughput won't go down. Does that make sense? When will flow rate go up as a res result of a reduction in whip? When it's disproportional, right? When a reduction in whip results in a disproportional reduction in flow time, when a reduction of whip of 50% results in a 75% reduction in flow time, my flow rate will go up. We can predict it quite accurately with, with Little's Law. And yet, most lean and, sorry to say, most TOC practitioners and even experts don't know this. They make a recommendation and they don't know that their recommendation can in fact harm the system if they're solving the wrong problem. Does it make sense to everybody? And again, simulation models is really nice because I, don't, I can replace knowledge with the ability to play, right? I don't need to know up front. I can make a change, see what happens. Oh boy, it didn't give me the result I expected. Now let me see why. So, is overproduction the only decision mistake for which practical mechanisms are needed? I, I looked back and said, what's the goal? As, this is an important question, especially when you're dealing with, a, with an NGO or government agency. They confuse kind of a vision and mission with a goal. Uh, so we just came up with a very simple statement and said, your goal is to simply meet the demand that's placed on you as effectively and efficiently as possible. 
Now, your, what makes it difficult is you not just expect it to meet average demand, but peaks in demand and have enough protective capacity to deal with that. So how should you do that? As you, should Im you should focus on improving flow. That should be the number one priority. And having a very simple cumulative flow diagram can show you if you are successfully meeting all the demand that's placed on you or is there work in w backlog growing or work in queue growing. So what I've tried to do is to classify them into where we are losing flow. So this represents both my flow time and flow rate. So the top is my total lead time, the bottom is my touch time, or the top is my bottleneck capacity, the top of the green is currently how much the system is producing. So 70 versus 35, or four weeks versus four days. What are the mistakes I make in planning, which is decisions before we start the work, is if I allocate resources ahead of time based on forecast, and those resources are stuck in the wrong place, I will lose potential throughput and add time, because now flow is waiting for resources in one area where it should have been in another area. This is a common mistake that's made in Lean. They create little work cells, right? Say, so let's reorganize the lines by work cell. Now what I do is I take a little unit that had three polishing machines, and I go and allocate it to three different lines. All that happens is when work is waiting for one polishing machine, another polishing machine, and another production line is starting at idle. I've lost all the, the aggregation by allocating those things ahead of time based on forecasted demand. If polishing machines was a bottleneck, this is a really bad idea. If budget is a bottleneck, it's a really bad idea to allocate budget ahead of time before I know where it's really going to be required. And as a result, I'm triggering the spend it or lose it type of phenomena where all the under-expenditures are not reported or wasted, all the over-expenditures are added. The second mistake I make in this planning side is local buffering. So as a result, I need a practical mechanism to dynamically allocate resources, whether that resource is manpower or budget, um, and I need a practical mechanism to aggregate buffers, like I showed you with the time buffer concept. The second mistake we make is we ignore backlog when we make commitments, we don't control the release of work in process. And as a result, I need practical mechanisms to quote lead times based on the backlog that's already there. In TOC, we call it planned load. So the total load on the bottleneck plus half the time buffer becomes my commitment. I can't, can't keep on quoting two weeks if I've got a backlog of four weeks. It's not going to happen. And secondly, I need a, a prioritized release control mechanism. In execution, one of the mistakes I made that can waste flow time or flow rate is I have unsynchronized priorities. I start without a full kit, and I batch or multitask. And again, I need practical mechanisms to prevent those mistakes. Single priority system, only start with a full kit and single piece flow as far as possible. And then the fourth mistake um, that I make the second in execution, which is decisions I make while we do the work, is I have too much or too little expediting. Uh, I don't update my buffers with the real status, and I don't expedite when I, when I should, or I expedite too much. All of that will waste, waste flow. And then the last uh, category is under measure and improve decisions I make after completing the work. If I measure everything, all the local efficiencies, all the variances, um, I'm going to be wasting a huge amount of management attention, causing people to focus in the wrong areas. So I should abolish that and replace it with simple Pareto analysis on what's causing the main flow delays, both in terms of the flow of, of work, the flow of money. And then the last mistake is acting on these local efficiency metrics and variances, spending resources or improving in the wrong area. Um, Again, I need a practical mechanism to focus on that. So what I realized from that was that whereas we had these four concepts of flow, actually number one is just the goal. The focus should be on improving flow. That should be our goal. Why is it important? Because it's a, the it's a highest leverage point of meeting all the demand as effectively and efficiently. 
and doing it in a way that will improve quality, due date, performance, costs, etc. The second thing, I need practical mechanisms. Not just for reducing overproduction, but for preventing mistakes I make in planning, execution, measure, and improve. And as I mentioned, no surprise, it turns out this follows the PDCA cycle, planning, doing, checking, acting, which is the Deming cycle. So it turns out that I can make mistakes in each step of this Deming cycle. And as a result, I simply need practical mechanisms to reduce this. So this is a, um, a sort of a summary of what I wanted to present in the first part of this is how do I improve any environment is I turn the focus on improving flow. How do I improve flow? I have to give people the most practical mechanisms to reduce the common mistakes that's causing losses in flow. Some of those mistakes happen in planning, some of it in execution, some of it in measurement and improvement. And how do I turn it into a specific application? Is I look at the concept and I say, I'm in projects. What does dynamically allocating resources mean in a project environment? How do we do it? What does aggregating buffers mean in a project environment? And that's how I go from concept to application. So building a dynamic simulation model, <coughs> what we did in the model that we'll show you is what I've started to do is to say, you start off by selecting the type of environment. The only difference between the type of environment is the nature of the flow that's going through there, the nature of the work. Production, they make widgets. Pro projects, the work is project tasks. Services, the work is people going through the system. Back office, it is information going through the system. Maintenance environment, what's going through the system is equipment being maintained. So I can model it generically and then I can start tracking as work is arriving in the system, how much is, how long is that work spending in backlog? How long is it waiting for, for server A or process A to become available? How long does it spend inside of process A? And this should give me a good idea if I can practically measure this, where is flow being lost at the moment? So uh, this is just what, what we've done, tried to do with the simulation, is just uh, trying to see how can we monitor an overall system to see where are we losing most of the flow. And then what we're also doing in the simulation is I'm continuously trying to compare scenarios between using one rule versus another. And how can I do that? Is I can calculate the amount of potential that is being lost. So we calculate theoretically what's the shortest flow time based on adding up all the cycle times in the model and comparing that with the actual lead times or flow time that's coming out. So we can see the actual lead time is 100 days. I add up all the flow times, it's 10 days. So I'm losing 90% of my flow time based on queues and backlog. Where is it? Let me see if I can see where it is. Or my bottleneck capacity is 10, I'm getting five out, I've lost 50% of the capacity. So the model that uh, Andre will be showing you is just very simple. When you open it up, it allows you to select a type of environment, operations, projects, etc. It, it allows you to s select some standard scenarios and then be able to create a new scenario if you want and then to run it, make some customizations and to select the flow management rules that you want. Here are the, the, the six rules that we've, we've got that you can select, two of those in planning, two of those in execution, two of those in the measurement and improvement side. So you can set up the environment with the old local short-term optimal rules, and then you can run scenario comparisons and say, if I don't <laughs> allocate all the resources ahead of time, what will happen if I compare the scenarios? So I'll just open up the model and... Uh, what we can see at the top is I got the performance I expected. So 100% due date performance, my quality is 100%. I got very close to 12. The only loss was when I start up the system, there's no work in process, so I lost a little bit of work there. My flow time was 10. My cost per unit was around $18.40 per unit. I've got good productivity above one, which is throughput over operating expenses. I've got a net profit of 780, 
and the number of special cause events that would have occupied management attention was only five. And you can see the distribution in the flow time there. It's literally two hours, two hours, two hours, two hours, two hours. Look what happens when we're adding variation. Suddenly, I'm struggling to meet the demand, and I can see on my flow time how the flow time is starting to grow, and the biggest portion of where the growth is is happening in backlog, which is a darker brown color. So I can very quickly see where I'm losing most of my, my demand and flow time. And I can see how my quality deteriorates all the way down to about 78%. Sorry for the, um, the, the numbers are not very clear. I can see how my throughput rate is dropping from around 12 to just above 9. My flow time is increasing all the way up to 111 uh, hours. My cost per unit is increasing. My profits is dropping down, and the number of uh, uh, management attention defects is dramatically increasing. Whereas just by adding this one central resource and allocating the central resource uh, based on where the biggest queue is developing within the processes, so not allocating all my capacity ahead of time, I can get back to 100% due date performance. But interestingly enough, my cost per unit also drops from 20 down to 18. So the money I invested, if I needed to invest money to make that resource available, was very much worthwhile. Right? So this is a, just a simple example of, of using this type of simulation, and there's obviously many simulation tools out there. You can build a simulation in Excel or in a, using a, we use a, a software called AnyLogic for that. So, so this is what we wanted to show you with the simulator, is that when we are creating changes, how do we predict what the impact of these changes will be? One is that I understand the, the concepts and I'm really confident, um, and I try to convince people, but simulators is a really good tool, a very effective tool, and we've seen it with the multitasking game, with the dice game, etc. The only negative with those is that people say, well, my environment is a bit more complex, right? What we try to do here is to share with you some of the insights that we've had in doing this research to say we have to be very, very careful. When we make recommendations, these recommendations are based on assumptions. When we tell people to control the release of work or to cut whip, that only works when I'm not controlling the release of work in process, and that's the main cause for the delays at the moment. But if I'm already doing that and I actually I have a very big backlog compared to the amount of in-process inventory, not only I won't get the benefit, but it might actually harm the system by doing that. So it's very early days, but we thought uh, it might be interesting to share with you some of our new discoveries. So in terms of summary, um, when we're trying to improve systems, we have to pay attention to what are the common mistakes that are being made in the way that we make planning, conceptual mistakes, is the, the way that we allocate resources and the way that we allocate safety. That's the first mistake that we make. The second mistake that we make is ignoring the backlog when we make commitments and not controlling the release of work in process into the system. In the execution side, the two mistakes that we make is we allow people locally decide on the priorities, which will cause priorities to be unsynchronized throughout the chain. And especially in assembly type environments, that's devastating. Because everybody will be busy, but at the back end you'll always miss one or more parts. Or allowing people to start work without having a full kit, or allowing them to do batching or multitasking. Those are all mistakes in the execution side. The, the, the last mistake in execution is people not updating the system, so we can't see what the status of the system is. Is, is the penetration of our buffers changing? Is the buffers becoming red, yellow, uh, or is it already in the black? And should that trigger expediting? Uh, Andre showed you the, the big impact it has to stop expediting everything and just expedite the things that are red and black. It makes a dramatic impact. Uh, when you expedite everything, all, basically all that happens is this, the distribution of the lead times just keeps on increasing over time. And then the last element is on the measurement and improvement side is not to measure everything, not to measure every single efficiency and utilization, 
but to only pay attention to what's causing the delays at the moment, what's causing things to go into the red and the black, and then acting only on those, not to react on underutilization or overutilization immediately, because then we're reacting to noise, and we'll end up either spending too much money on the wrong thing or not spending enough money on the right thing. 